Evolutionists tell us that oil formed deep within the earth over millions of years from the remains of long dead organisms. What they don't tell us is that oil has been created in the lab and it only took 20 minutes. To make matters worse, Russian scientists have known for over a century how to create hydrocarbons using nothing more than iron oxide, marble, and pure water. It has nothing to do with living things. The proof of this can be found throughout our solar system as hydrocarbons like methane have been found on nearly every planet and moon we've examined. Back on Earth, when we find oil, it is always found in a pressurized state. According to geologists, the rocks containing these oil deposits could only hold them in place for a maximum of 15,000 years before equilibrating. If that wasn't enough, there are only about 100 billion tons of offshore oil in the world, and about 5 million tons of oil seeps into the ocean each year. At this rate, it would take only about 20,000 years to deplete that quantity. If oil is 50 million years old, a quantity 2,500 times the present reservoirs would have been lost to seepage. So much for their millions of years. Looks like the best explanation is that the oil we use formed quickly from abiotic material from the primordial earth only a few thousand years ago. So why is mainstream science ignoring such overwhelming evidence? I had to investigate. There's a lot we don't know about oil formation. The conventional model is that at some point in the distant past, perhaps as far back as 200 million years, vast amounts of zooplankton and algae settled at the bottom of seas and lakes mixing with sediment. Like the peak conditions for coal, a buildup of dead organic matter occurred in an environment devoid of oxygen. As more layers compiled, intense heat and pressure built up. This process caused the organic matter to change into a waxy material known as kerogen. As heat and pressure accumulates, the kerogen undergoes a process called catagenesis, transforming into liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons. From there, a process of pyrolysis, a thermal decomposition of materials at elevated temperatures in an inert atmosphere, transforms hydrocarbons into petroleum. From here, the petroleum will migrate by seeping through porous sedimentary rock until it reaches an impermeable layer of rock or makes its way to the surface. OPEC reports that there are 1.5 trillion barrels of crude oil left in the world. In the ocean, oil does indeed seep out at a rate of 5 million tons per year. At this rate, it will take the seepage about 43 3 million years to deplete the worldwide supply. But this has little to do with how much oil was present initially. When the oil, water, and gas reaches impermeable material, it becomes trapped. Pressures can build up to 3,000 pounds per square inch, which is kept in place by surface pressures beginning at 5,000 pounds per square inch. This is essentially the model geologists assume when determining where to find petroleum trapped under the earth. As early as 1877, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev, among others, became supporters of an abiotic or abiogenic origin for petroleum. They theorized that hydrocarbons were generated within the earth by interaction of water with iron carbide. In 1933, Vladimir Vernadsky concluded that with increasing depth in the earth's crust, the oxygen content would decrease to zero and the content of hydrogen would increase, leading to the formation of hydrocarbons. In the 1940s, following World War II, the Soviet Union was thought to have limited petroleum reserves and was essentially denied access to the major oil fields of the world. This initiated a 1947 project to determine the origins of petroleum in order to establish the most effective strategies for petroleum exploration. In 1951, at the All-Union Petroleum Geology Congress, Nikolai Kudryovsev presented an overview of his biogenic theory. This was more fully fleshed out by Vladimir Porfiryev in 1974 in the American Association of Petroleum Geologists Bulletin. Porfiryev claimed that methane, naphthene, and aromatic hydrocarbons had been obtained from carbon dioxide, water, and H2 synthetically, and proposed that they were the original compounds for the formation of the petroleum hydrocarbons in the mantle. What was considered most convincing, however, was the predicted occurrence of commercial quantities of oil in crystalline and metamorphic basement rocks. This left the questions of exactly which hydrocarbons were formed, what transformations were required to convert these precursor hydrocarbons into oil and gas, and how this oil ultimately became incorporated in reservoirs located in crystalline 
or perhaps more pertinently, sedimentary rocks. With isolation from the Cold War as well as the language barrier, the full crux of this proposal did not reach the Western world for decades. Between 1979 and 1985, Thomas Gold presented his own revision of the abiogenic theory accentuating the role of earthquakes in the migration of hydrocarbons in a gas form from the deep earth. To support this, he and Steven Soder prepared a map of the world showing the correlation between major oil and gas regions and locations of past and present seismic activity. Noting differences in topography in oil regions along the arc from Indonesia to southern China, he concluded that even these deposits were evidence of a deep source for hydrocarbons, including methane. By 1992, however, Gold had theorized that subterranean bacteria could also have catalyzed the material into oil, but no such bacterial process has ever been observed. Observed. Further supporting the abiogenic hypothesis was the discovery that methane is extremely common in the solar system, especially amongst the gas giant planets. It should be noted, however, that this is methane not petroleum. In 2002, the abiogenic model was given a further boost when a team of scientists led by Jack Kenney of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Gas Resources Corporation in the U.S. successfully synthesized the constituent hydrocarbons that comprise petroleum from iron oxide and marble under intense pressure and heat. The flaw in the Russian model is that the temperatures and pressures required to convert methane into higher hydrocarbons would require methane to be at least 100 kilometers below the Earth's surface. Kenny's experiment concluded that no hydrocarbons higher than methane are precipitated in any less temperatures or pressures, and even then, the conditions they simulated were ideal conditions for hydrocarbon synthesis. From the team's own paper and the proceedings of the International Academy of Sciences, the theoretical calculations for the evolution of hydrocarbons posited the presence of methane, the genesis of which must itself be demonstrated in the depths of the earth consistent with the pressures required for the evolution of heavier hydrocarbons. Therefore, the theoretical results must be considered as the determination of minimum boundary conditions for the genesis of hydrocarbons. But again, it should be noted that the experiment yielded hydrocarbons, not petroleum. While Kenny's experiment did succeed in showing that hydrocarbons can be synthesized inorganically, deep core drilling of the Siljan Ring and other locations have all thus far failed to discover any hydrocarbons, including methane, in the mantle. Although many young Earth creationists posit this experiment as a challenge to an old Earth, the Russian model of oil formation does not propose any kind of fast migration of petroleum to the surface over 100 kilometers or to build up in a reservoir after traveling through various materials of varying permeability. The observed rate of 3 to 30 meters every 10 years means that the minimum amount of time for the migration is 300,000 years. The biogenic model, however, was given significant support in 2013 when a team from the U.S. Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, led by Douglas C. Elliott, synthesized several hydrocarbons, including methane and especially petroleum, in the form of crude oil from algae. The team created a continuous process that starts with wet algae and subjects the entire mass to high temperatures of 350 degrees Celsius or 662 degrees Fahrenheit and pressures of 3,000 pounds per square inch. Published in the October 2013 issue of the journal Algal Research, the continuous system processes 1.5 liters of slurry into various biofuels, including petroleum, per hour. The temperatures and pressures involved are considerably less than those at the mantle, and the byproducts of this process include clean water, fuel gas, and nutrients which can be recycled to grow even more algae. Again, it should also be noted that this laboratory process does not resemble the processes going on in the Earth. While it may in fact be possible for inorganic oil to form, the abiogenic model does not predict what we see in nature and often contradicts what we do see. Our knowledge of oil formation may never be complete, but the biogenic model accurately predicts the findings of Elliott's experiment. The geologically ancient model of oil formation is consistent with what we know about geology and chemistry. It is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.